Welcome everyone to another episode of the Hall of Fame show here in Mount Manitoba, overlooking the home of the Winnipeg Jets. And I'm your host, Kurt Buckner. I run, I operate, uh, not in Hall of Fame.com, the fictitious athlete Hall of Fame, the fictitious rock and roll Hall of Fame, the United States Athletic Hall of Fame, which you can vote on right now, www.notinhalloffame.com forward slash USA. But it doesn't happen without this man to, I guess, my left, right, I don't know. Uh, but it's Evan Nolan. I'm I'm both angels on your shoulder, my friend. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, uh, I had something else in my head. I I, 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 ha- I have I have to check in with you though. How is Canada speaking of the Winnipeg Jets doing with the fact that we are probably I mean the last game's in overtime, but we're probably looking at a Miami Vegas Stanley Cup final with one of them winning their first championship. Uh, well, I I can, I can only speak for me. Uh, How'd you have told me 20 years ago this was? Because I remember being sort of all cranky when it was, uh, who was it? Anaheim against, I forget. Uh, I think, was it Anaheim, Carolina? It might have been. Yeah, and I was not a happy camper with that. But hockey in your country has evolved, especially in the South. Mm -hmm. And I did go to a Vegas game uh, with my wife some time ago. Uh, they support the team very, very well. Uh, we've seen it how they how well they do in Nashville, Carolina, Tampa, Florida, uh, Miami, not as well, but no, I mean that team that team was on the verge of moving. I'll, I'll I'll put it this way: it doesn't bother me because those cities are supporting it. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas if I thought it was a, a a city that was fair weather, or like I'll, I'll say or or let's say uh they give Atlanta back an expansion team. And because of the way the expansion set up now, and all of a sudden they 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 build a team that could go and win the whole thing. Oh, I'll be really happy for the city of Atlanta then. But I hope my sarcasm was coming out flowing perfectly uh, on that one. But no, uh, twenty years ago, different answer than I have now. Now I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. I mean, I, I would have preferred other ones just because I'm still more of a traditionalist. But well, it, it it still bothers me that had uh, had. A, the Bruins held on in Game 7, but B, in Game 5, if that breakaway that Marshawn has goes in, mm-hmm. they're out. And instead, since that point, they've won now uh, three uh, – they've won 11 of 12 games mm-hmm. in the playoffs. Which well, I, mean, I, I think uh, come – pretty soon I'm going to have an elevator up with a lot of Panthers. I know that much. Yeah. I'm just gonna like uh, hold off on that for a bit. I've got a no, 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 Kachuk. That's all I ask. I know I hate that guy. No problem. Although, although high school classmates with whom? Well, let's see. Uh, let's, let me take a guess here. All right, so he. I'm guess. I think he grew up in. Some, some, some someone's still in the playoffs right now. It... Okay. Well, let's see. Did he grow up in Arizona? He did not. Dad. Oh, he did not. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know who. Uh, well, at least at least school school grade classes to Jason Tatum. Oh, okay, still still in the playoffs well, in St. Louis. Okay. So, I, I I would not have guessed that in. Yeah, there, there's there's pictures of the two of them as like twelve year olds together. So. I, I I will say this though, if uh, and I know my aunt, the Heat lost today, but holy crap, uh. I, Okay, you're still in there, but I mean, like, if you would have thought, like, beforehand, and I would have made the same offer to you. Uh, okay, so you've got both Miami teams, and I have everybody yeah. else. Uh, you would have told me to F off how many times over. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, the Celtics should have already won the series. The Bruins should have put away the Panthers and didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, the Celtics should have already won the series. They threw a gateway game one and one, but definitely game two. Yeah. Uh, game three, they completely forgot there was a game after the third, like the third quarter. I don't know what happened there. That that's uh, why you play. They, that's why you play. But four, four, they showed up. Five, they showed up. We'll see what happens in on Saturday for Game Six. So mm-hmm. right well, now, it's still looking good for your bet though, because I don't think either of these teams can beat Denver. So, uh, who's to say? I'm just okay. really wondering what this. If you're a new listener, uh, I I I made a wager over a beer. A beer. Uh, a single beer. A single beer, yes. Uh, we, we are like uh, the two people in trading places. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> it's, and here is your $1. Yeah, so we uh, 
We uh, the bet was that I took both Boston teams and he took the field. Both Boston teams won the championship. I got, uh, I won the bet, which obviously can't happen. If both Boston teams did not win, then he won the bet. Uh, and if one team won, there's a push. So there's still opportunity for push. I took the bet because I was like, you know, I'd be happy with winning, of course, mm -hmm. but I'd also be happy with the push. So it wasn't a bad one, like going, going. Push is still win. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of people. I mean, I agreed with what Sportsnet said, which was going to be Boston defeating Edmonton in the finals. Yeah. But but I, nope. I think Instead, it's going to be Boston's coach. We ran out of town, maybe taking on the, the Panthers in the final. So with the Winnipeg coach who ran, who, who ran out of town by choice. Yeah, that's also true. So, yeah. But anyway. uh, anywho, uh, we've got, we, we were, away last week because i was on a houseboat which was a lot and, of fun so and i was trying to get some more stuff done for the uh for the yeah. u.s hall here which i did um mm -hmm. so we'll have that hopefully coming up pretty soon let's start should we start i know we had a couple major deaths this week yeah let's just start with the let's start with the r&b hall just so it's there and we can get out of the way do you want to yeah, do that and then we'll just sort of like do do yeah that. Let's, let's, okay. just, sure. let's just knock that out all right uh, so, okay, when the, I don't get lost, so. yeah the r&b hall of fame which in theory, because I feel like I'm going to be really, really positive and really negative on this, but let's just look at the positive here. It's it's a loaded group. It's I don't is it their 12th or 13th? Well, they began an in inception in 2010, so this is 2023. I think they missed a couple uh, for mm -hmm. whatever reason. And uh, I've got my this listed in alphabetical order, and uh, I, I can't. I'm going to say up front that there's a lot of these people who I'm very happy for. Uh, saying that as I was doing sort of a deeper dive on their website. And if guys, if you're listening on the R&B Hall of Fame, guys, you, you got to do something about that website. It's awful. It's it's not very good. It's There's not a lot of information on it. Uh, there's a lot of people who you, you honor that I wasn't aware of, and there's not that much information on the internet about them. So if you inducted them, I would love to know more about why they're in this hall. Uh, it's R&B. You could argue, and I think a lot of people can, that just the name alone sounds like it should be more prestigious than the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Some people might make that argument. Uh, I don't know that I would, but I'd say it's pretty much right up there. Uh, so that, that's something that they have to do. When we, we go through this class, we're going to see some people that seem like sure things to us. Names that, like, how were they not in already? And who? Mm -hmm. And a couple, I couldn't find out anything. And I tried. I, I, I definitely tried. So uh, I hope I, I did this as balanced as possible when I, when I try to present that. But uh, alphabetically speaking, uh, the probably the headliner when I saw most of the articles uh, was Aaliyah. Mm -hmm. uh, pro someone who could have been a Janet Jackson-like star, I think. Mm hmm the, fir the first the first celebrity death that really shook me because she and oh. i are born the same, same month okay but she's born in january of 79 as well so me joe thornton and Aaliyah. so mm. yeah, oh joe retire just retire don't do these commercials about your beard retire don't do this bomber mansky shit sorry let's let, let go back to Aaliyah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Uh, yeah, 11 top 10 in the R&B charts. Uh, Would have had so much more. She was only 22. My God. Uh, mm -hmm. Man, if she was alive during the whole surviving R. Kelly stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. it, there would have been a whole lot. This There was everything about her that, that could have been a major star. I don't know who would sort of accept on her behalf, but I mean, it, it's, it's a wonderful induction. Uh, anything more to add on Aaliyah? No, I mean, just uh shooting star across the sky who got crashed far too soon absolutely so. yeah and in, I, I also it was a plane crash right yeah so there was nothing not one of those janice joplin you know or amy winehouse but it, 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 it was a plane crash because they had too much luggage on the plane the pilot told them you have too much stuff and they said take it anyway and then the plane didn't make it so yeah. uh so continuing on uh someone who's this is i guess now a two-time member and that's another criticism I have here with, with the with the R&B Hall. When they induct a group, I don't know which members. And especially with a lot mm. of these R&B groups, they go through a lot of members. Mm. 
Uh, so I'm assuming he's he was he was one of the people chosen, uh, and that's Gerald Alston, uh, who was uh, the lead singer of the Manhattans. I just wrote that up that he must be already in. I assume that he was. Uh, he had a decent solo career. Uh, nothing huge. I mean, three top forty hits. Mm -hmm. But uh, so he's in. Uh, Ruby Andrews. Uh, so she had a few hits in the late '60s and early '70s. Uh, with one her big biggest hit uh number nine on r&b uh i like this one a lot casanova your playing days are over oh yeah i've heard that song yeah so uh so she's in uh and one who i might have thought might have been already in uh brooke benton mm -hmm. uh just beautiful soulful voice piles upon piles of hits a lot of uh crossover success yep uh pebo bryson Feels weird for him to be going in without like a duet partner. Yeah, because <laughs> a lot of you might think, I know that name, I know that name, but uh, I can show you. No, I'm not going to do it. But yes, a whole yeah. new world. That's his, that was his biggest hit. But he. Well, if, you you if, also remember one with Crystal Gale, too, right? Was just you and I him? Uh, yeah, so that I celebrate my love with Roberta Flack. Yeah. Um, God. He had a real duet called Just You and I, but I don't know who it was. But that doesn't, I don't think that was with Peebo Bryson. I don't, mind um, I don't. Hold on. So we had, uh, he had a couple of Madly Cole, one with Minnie Ripperton, Melissa Manchester, three with Roberta Flack, one with Chuck Kahn, Regina Bell, Angela Bofill. Celine Dion, Beauty and the Beast, but with Celine Dion. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah that's right. Regina Bell was uh, Aladdin. Uh, uh, Debbie Gibson. Well, I missed that one, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, he had a whole bunch of them, though, uh, with, like, that's basically his thing, is he sings a a romantic love duet with somebody. So He's got the, he, there's no better voice than that. Yeah, he's won two Grammys for Beauty and the Beast and for A Whole New World, so. Well, he showed you the world. Uh, here's someone I don't know. Actually, I should have checked to see if he was still alive or not. Uh, maybe you're about to see him. Uh, G.C. Cameron, uh, former lead singer of the Spinners during their height of the Detroit era. So he was yeah. the lead singer in, uh, for, for my favorite hit, uh, It's a Shame. Mm, I yeah. don't think he is still alive. Probably not, but I'm assuming he's a two-time inductee because the Spinners are in. Uh, Spinner is yeah. also now Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induct, and Evan's gonna take a lot of pictures next month, right? Yeah, I'm gonna do the best I can. It's it's a Tuesday, which is a tough day for me. Actually, GC Cameron's still alive. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah, he's 77. So, all right. Now, this one I'm gonna admit, and I think I've got this right. When I was doing enough research on it, and this was all I could come up with. Uh, so this group, the group of the Debonairs. Mm. Uh, so comprising of cousins uh, Joyce Wilson and Telma Hopkins who would become Don. Yeah. Uh, Orlando and Don. I couldn't find any other group. They didn't really have much success on their own before this. So I find it a little curious, but maybe they just thought, okay, these two need to be in. And we're not going to put Tony Orlando and Don in the RB Hall of Fame. Put it this way. If you type the debonairs, I just did that into Wikipedia. Yeah. The only thing that comes up is uh, the page for the aristocrats, the offensive joke performance. Same. <laughs> same. I, it was the same is, as I was doing my search. Which is awkward. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so I'm assuming that this is, I could not, in every article I found, I could not figure that out. And that's, I guess, one of these big criticisms that I sort of have here, because Okay, have, and, have more stuff for us here. Well, yeah. yeah, and tell me, what am I missing on the? Because I couldn't find anything even that much about what this group did before, other than mm -hmm. it was their springboard to eventual fame. Mm -hmm. Is this a Hall of Fame career, especially when you look at the person next in alphabetical order, Jermaine Dupree, former Mister Janet Jackson. Right, like eighteen, he was he generated eighteen R and B number ones, eighteen, mm -hmm. and he's going. He's not in already. Yeah, I mean, they're, they the list of people who aren't in is also interesting, anyway. But yeah, continue. Yeah, because yeah, we don't know who the voting body is, how many people. We know nothing. Yeah, this is somehow less transparent than the Rock Hall. 
It's a lot less transparent than the Rock Hall. And, that, and that's a bar we trip over. Yeah. <sighs> so. All right. So Gwen Fox uh, did a lot of gospel, a lot of soul. From what I can saw, what I can see, no hits, but she did a lot of background work uh, supporting the Detroit scene. Mm -hmm. Of still, still alive. I mean, like, I mean, her social media doesn't have that many followers. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got the right one, but I'm well, not. She also, sure. she also has her Wikipedia page either. So yeah, so which made it so much harder. Uh, Hall mm -hmm. and Oates, we all know who yeah. they are. Uh, 2014 yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. Uh, I would imagine now that knowing that GC Cameron's alive, I'm sure they're thrilled because I think the Spinners were among their idols when they were growing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I remember uh, Hall saying, "You know, we're happy to be in the Rock Hall, but we should we shouldn't be here until the spinners are." Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm sure that is fantastic for them. Uh, Thelma Houston, one of my favorite songs from the '70s, "Don't Leave Me This Way." Okay, I absolutely love that freaking song so much. It, it's a ph phenomenal disco tune. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Linda Jones uh, passed away at age 27 in 1972, my birth year, going into a diabetic coma. Uh, she, mm -hmm. so I was listening a bit of, just trying to understand who, because I, I wasn't familiar with her. Man, what a voice. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. I, I, I'm pissed off I never heard of her until this. Yeah, I hadn't heard of her either. So, yeah. Well, here's another one that I guessed King Arthur. And from what I, I think it's an early hip hop star. It did a lot of mixtapes. I yeah, think I, I went I went looking and all I could find, of course, was the Good Night of the Round Table and the Flower Brand. So because I went looking, I'm like, who's King Arthur? I didn't I couldn't find it. Yeah, so I, I'm Which guessing why they need, why they need better pages on this stuff. Well, I'd like to know what what's the mindset here. Like I'm I'm sure it's something pretty good, but mm -hmm. I, I've got no clue. Uh, someone we've talked about a lot, it, like indirectly, Clyde McFadder. Yep. Uh, so for, for, he's got his own club in the Rock Hall. He's in his club here. Three times, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, that, he's, that he was inducted with the other two groups. And, uh, I mean, the Drifters are in. Who's the other group he's in? I, I always forget. Oh, uh, man. Uh, Drifters and Billy Ward and the Dominoes. No, I think those are the two. Oh no, those are the two. Yeah, I always, I always, for whatever reason, in my head, think it's three. That's yeah. Clapton. Yeah, just Clapton is in three yeah. times. Yeah, because McFadden's club because he was the first. He was the first with two. Yeah. Uh, Sam Moore of uh, Sam and Dave. Yep. Hold on, I'm coming. Great song. Absolutely. Uh, new yep. addition. Boston Boys. Mr. Telephone Man. Uh, mm -hmm. 15 top 10 hits on the R&B chart, uh, massively successful, hugely influential, considering. And all of them, all of them had independent success. Yeah. Um, only one of them killed Whitney Houston, but still. Oh, boy. I don't see that one. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, uh, just growing up, new edition was one of the most important groups in, in Boston when I was growing up. Like, everybody freaking loved them. Mm -hmm. uh, cool It Now, I still think, is probably my favorite of theirs. Uh, I, I loved Cool It Now. There's something about that song. Candy Girl's a good song, too, but I always love Cool It Now. Yep. It's, uh, it's fun. They're talented. Uh, one of the things I reviewed, actually, with Chris Bornet on a uh, this crap was on national television. It was Rowdy Roddy Piper doing a whole uh, introduction of the Saturday morning cartoon lineup with special <laughs> guests, New Edition. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Hervé Villachez. Wow. Yes. Yeah. It, that's, uh, that's literally who are three people who have never been in my kitchen. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Ronnie Nelson. Uh, from what I can tell, he was a musical director for The Temptations, so it's got to be the same guy. Uh, yeah, so okay, yeah. That's seemed right. to be one hell of a drummer from what I was reading. Uh, Priscilla Price had a few R and B hits in the seventies. 
Uh, DD Sharp, mashed potato time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mashed potato time. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, this one, I, when I when I was writing that, then I, I listened to this album again because it's so good. Uh, Dusty Springfield. So I was re-listening to Dusty in Memphis. Uh, she, from what I can tell, she never actually had an R and B hit in the United States, but probably should have from the from the tracks in Dusty in Memphis. Possible. Dusty Springfield is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, the Stubbs girls. Uh, basically, they're the family of Levi Stubbs, who's a very legendary figure, but okay, they perform much of anything other than were Levi's kids. I don't know. Um, tell me why, Hall of Fame. I, like, I don't want to disrespect them. I don't, but I, I, I researched what I could. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I have blank, because I don't know who it, what it is. Sweet Boogie Productions. Not a clue. I, I couldn't find anything on them either. Yeah. And uh, Dee Dee Warwick, the sister of Dion, who had uh, eight top 40 hits of, on her own. Uh, they're going to do that ceremony on the 24th in Detroit. Uh, that could be fun to go to. 24th of uh, September. September, sorry, yes. Uh, so, yeah. It's cool. all across the board. I really want to learn more about that. I thought maybe I, want to, I wanted to sort of like reach out to see if I can get an interview with someone, but then I, I do I want to because I got a lot more questions. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. Well, I got. I got I, to I'm, sit on that for a bit. I, I'm still trying to get someone from the Strong Museum to talk to us from the Toy Hall of Fame. I just can't get them to get give me the time of day. So we'll, we'll get there. I think that'd be cool. I'd love to talk to Toy Hall of Fame people. Strong Museum. I'm sure you're listening to us. Please, somebody respond to my emails. So, wow, we love you guys. Yeah, fantastic. I just want to. I want to know the process. And I want to know as a former child and someone who has been in both. Toys R Us and Stack Toys at KB. If I am qualified to be on the uh, nominating or voting committee for that, it's more than qualified than I am to be the WNBA commissioner. Fair enough. <laughs> Although I'm telling you, my idea is it'll work. We would have got a million people to watch Britney's comeback, but anyway, they weren't bad. So anyway, all right. So now that we've gotten the the actual hall of the news out of the way, uh, unfortunately, we're good to the big news of the week was is the second section, the one that I normally do. Yeah. Uh, lost legends in really four different arenas. Yeah. Uh, Wrestling, poker, yeah. music, and football. Who do you want to start with? Uh, let's start with Jim Brown. Uh, I. What can you say about Jim Brown? Uh, the accolades that he had, you know, are, are so staggering. Uh, one of the most recent ones, I don't named it by who is it? The College Football Hall of Fame is the greatest college football player of all time. Sure. Which I don't know about that. I think he though there's a case that he is the best pro football player of all time. I don't. I mean, put it this way: when Barry Sanders broke Jim Brown's record, mm -hmm. Barry said that his dad said, "Don't make you don't think this makes you better than Jim Brown." <laughs> I didn't know that. But everyone yeah. who has passed Jim Brown needed a lot, a lot more games to do it. He did it in nine years. Nine years when they were playing less games. Yeah, they're playing less games. Also, while being maybe, maybe the greatest two sport athlete, honestly, you can make an argument with how good he was as a lacrosse player. Excellent lacrosse, uh, played uh, basketball. Apparently, he was also really good at ballroom dancing at Syracuse. Interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, if the again, it was on Wikipedia, so I don't know how accurate that is, but I mean, everything else there seems to be uh, relatively so. Uh, former MVP, NFL champion. Uh, there, you cannot talk about running backs without Jim Brown being one of the first people you talk about. It is not possible. Uh, and I think what also makes him such a special person is what he accomplished after. You know, a leading figure in civil rights, a leading figure in uh, just acting, you name it, everything he did it. So I, I think uh, 
what I would encourage a lot of people to do, just to sort of like remember Jim Brown, this is what I, I guess, I think I told you about this when I stumbled across this a couple of years ago. Uh, Dick Cavett uh, has the YouTube page where they put up a lot of old interviews from the show. There's one where it's Jim Brown and Lester Maddox. Okay. And uh, Brown's poise, but still look like, do you do anything more, motherfucker? That's pretty much it. Is <laughs> it, It's a sight to behold. Uh, member also too of recently, and he looked pretty good then. So I, I I didn't check it, see what exactly it was, but he was older. Was eighty three? Jim Brown. Yeah. Uh, Brown was eighty seven. Oh, eighty seven. Okay. Uh, so, but yeah, because I remember he looked pretty good when we saw him on the NFL one hundred. Mm hmm. Yeah. But I mean, he's on. He is the NFL touchdown rushing leader for five times, eight-time rushing leader, nine-time Pro Bowl. He played nine years as a Pro Bowler all nine years. Mm -hmm. Three-time MVP, Rookie of the Year, went out as the MVP of the league in 65. Yeah. Uh, NFL champion in 64, Rookie of the Year. Like, I don't know, the 60s all like 18th, 75th, 100th, Burt Bell Award, like, what are what what else can you say about him? He averaged 5.2 yards a carry. And the great thing too, he you know, like what Barry was able to do, he left on his own terms before True. he was yeah, beating yeah. the crap up. He left when there's no reason to think he still couldn't have been an MVP again if he wanted to, or if he if he if his body held up. Mm -hmm. so he, he didn't leave the NFL a broken individual, he was still at the top of his game. He could have conceivably put that so far out of reach, but mm -hmm. then it, I wouldn't have had him in Dirty Dozen. I oh God, him. I love him in Dirty Dozen. I love that the scene. I, anyone, I don't want to ruin a movie that came out in 1967, uh, but because Dirty Dozen is a movie I watch every single time it's on, mm -hmm. like TV. If I'm flipping through a Dirty Dozen is on, I don't care where I am, I I click on. Uh, if I'm looking for something some night to watch and the Dirty Dozen's on Netflix or whatever other station, I watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, but like that movie uh, is one of the most important things to me. And the scene at the end with Jefferson uh, dropping the grenades to blow up the Chateau is one of the, I watched it actually the day he died again, just that scene. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I found it on YouTube. Uh, it's it's clip nine of ten, by the way. If you ever need to see the Dirty Dozen, um, <laughs> when I have it on whatever the, the break it down is. Um, but that movie is one of the most important movies of my life, uh, and Jim Brown is just so like both menacing, but also like goddamn, I want that man on my side. I wish every soldier were like him. So I, I think also too, just even I, I should have read stuff behind the scenes. Well, for someone who I don't think he acted before. Mm -mm, no, and that's the thing, because the other people in that movie, you've got Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, George Kennedy, Robert Reed, uh, John Cassavetes, Kelly Savalas, mm -hmm. uh, um, wife name is Clint. Why can't they Clint's last name? Um, crap, I gotta get a big the guy's name, but like Clint uh, Howard's in this film? I don't remember that. No, no, no. Donald know. Sutherland is in this movie. Oddball. Uh, yeah, oddball. That's a different one, but uh, this one is Pinkley. Um, which one am I thinking of? Uh, Hogan's Heroes, yeah. Uh, uh yeah. no, this one, uh, Pinkley has to pretend to be a general. He goes up to the soldier and he says, Where are you from, some soldier? And he goes, Madison City, Missouri, sir. Looks up and goes, Never heard of it. <laughs> Just keeps walking. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen the movie so many times, I love it so very much. Um, but yeah, even in the movie with all those great actors, he still completely stands out. Oh, and I left out, um, uh, what's his name from Death Wish? Um, Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson, yeah. So, but even with all those incredible actors, he completely stands out in that film. So Here's something to look up here while, while you're doing that. Uh, although, I, I, I had to know it's going to be like a movie for Evan. A, a football legend and they're killing Nazis. I mean, that's right up there for you. But yeah. Ooh, I'm just looking up when Lee Marvin was born here. I want to see Lee Marvin. That, this this is the only time one of my tweets has ever been aggregated. Actually, 
because they had one of those things where they're talking about how people look older in the past. Mm-hmm. I took a still scene from the Dirty Dozen with uh, Lee Marvin and, and Charles Bronson entering the German Chateau. And in that picture, Lee Marvin is 45 and Bronson is 43. And they both look their, like they're well into their 60s. Uh, Mar- so uh-huh. here, Marvin would have been 43. Four, or so, I'm sorry, that was it. It's 45 and 43. I just wanted to, see if, I wanted to see if he was uh, older or younger than you are now. He's he's younger than I am now. Okay. Yeah, I, I knew he was younger than me because I'm. I, I yeah. can't remember. There's a story about Lee Marvin. I can't remember who the he was trash. Lee Marvin was a, known as an incredible drinker. He was trash at a party and refused to give up his keys. So they took his keys. I can't remember who it was. Took his keys and Lee Marvin jumped on the roof of the car and held on. And so the driver's driving him home. Like if the driver is someone famous, I can't think who it is. Gets pulled over by the cops. And the cop says, are you aware that Lee Marvin is on the roof of your car? <laughs> and he goes, yes, I'm, I'm just trying to get the man home. <laughs> I can't remember who the who this told the story, but yeah, anyway. Back to Jim Brown. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I will say that, like, I think he is the GOAT. Uh, he's actually someone you can vote for on our hall, because we have a yes. Uh I, I, uh, I'm glad Cleveland has a team. Mm. I would have hated for him to pass away. In the, he wasn't he wasn't sick then. That was a long time ago. But that would have been tragic if he would have died in that time frame. I think. Mm. I mean, I know when I was a kid, I thought the team was named after him. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Mm. Probably, yeah. yeah. Just every team was founded by in the ni- every team found in the 1940s was founded by a guy with the last name of Brown. So the Celtics were as well. So um, it's but, not the it's yeah. not the most irrational thought when you're a child and you hear about oh 100 percent it's not play, but I mean like you you know you're 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 a sort of like sports geek like me right so like as soon as you're getting into that you're you're deep diving into all these players you never saw and seeing who's got mm-hmm. the most this most that and then you come across Jim Brown like oh god yeah. and then you see him in this great film and then he's always held in this rarefied yeah. air. Just, yeah, just by the way, I know we're going to get to the rest of Death later, but something sort of weird. So he was the lead in a movie called Slaughter in 1972. There's also Slaughter's big ripoff in 1973. His romantic partner from that, Marlene Clark, passed away the exact same day he did. Oh. Yeah, so they both passed away on May 18th, but she died at 73 and he was 87. So I just figured I'd wrap that. It was just a weird thing I saw when I was looking stuff up this week. Mm. So... Interesting. Anyway, yeah, Jim Brown, one of the, I would say it's easy to say he's one of the 10 greatest athletes in the history of the United States. I, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any list you can have of the 10 greatest athletes in the U.S. history that doesn't include Jim Brown. So My top three is him, Jackie Robinson, and Jim Thorpe. Uh, beyond that. Right. You know how I feel about Jim Thorpe. I know you feel about Jim Thorpe. And the one thing, I'm sorry, one last thing we have to bring up, we haven't brought up yet, is just his activism. Um, and and mm-hmm. there's that famous picture of, and left to right, it is Russell, Ali, Jim Brown, and Kareem. Or at that point, it was Lou Alcindor. Mm-hmm. Um, at the uh, anti-Vietnam War rally. Uh, just a it's not even a rally. They had they had a um, a sit down, but just one of the iconic pictures of the civil rights movement, uh, and just a man who uh, stood for his principles uh, and fought for them uh, his entire life. So I don't I don't know what else to say. Yeah. So well, we lost another great one, uh, and that's just recently. I, I think we should go to her next. Yeah, a hundred percent. She's next. Uh, Tina Turner, uh, and age 83, age 83. That's probably where I thought 83. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Possibly the greatest comeback story in music, not just rock, just music history for her to have come back from what she did. Uh, one half of Ike and Tina, Ike, brilliant musician, horrible individual or horrible domestic partner. Yeah. When, when there was a story just talking, about that quickly morgan fairchild posted something on twitter about the first 
time she met Tina Turner. She was 17 years old and huh? she was backstage at something. Yeah. And uh, she was talking to Tina and Ike literally came over and slammed Tina by the neck against the wall. And the 19 year old Morgan Fairchild had no idea what the hell she was supposed to do about it. And their fight was over and Tina went out and just absolutely sang her, her guts out as if nothing had ever happened. And Morgan Fairchild was like both disgusted and in awe. So you, you should go look up the story. Yeah, no, I will. That, I will. That she put up there. Um, so she went through yeah. that for what twenty years? Yeah, long freaking time. Like twenty years, because if that was seventeen, she they she finally left him in nineteen seventy six. So eighteen years. I think I read that the, that she joined the band in, when she was in fifty eight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's been like eighteen years of that were just finally reached the point but so but, e but even in, in that duo i was watching a lot of that just of, of that era i mean I, I far prefer and i know we just shit on ike and justifiably so that's my favorite music musical era of tina turner personally just because ike is just fair like, enough uh, sure. but i was trying to think of anyone I mean, whenever you, we've got an artist, you can always sort of compare them to somebody. I mean, there's some you can't. Mick Jagger comes to mind. Bowie mm -hmm. comes to mind. Tina Turner is in that era because there's no, or in that, that category. I'm trying to think, who looks like her? Who sounds like her? Who has that presence? And I can't come up with anything. I mean, there are people who would have, would fill those three spots, but not overlapping. Like the, not, the, the not all the one. Ones doesn't mesh yeah, you know what I mean? not all in one person i do think so when she was inducted into the kennedy honors mm -hmm. i think back in 2000 and it was five uh the person the person who inducted her originally and did most of her songs was beyonce um and beyonce is going to be the closest but i don't think she hits tina beyonce will have the greater well, she already does, has the greater catalog. Right. Uh, what Beyonce doesn't have, and it, it's sort of, it's it's summed up in Dreamgirls. You played the one with the weaker voice. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, it's, and it feels weird even taking a shot at Beyonce's voice. It's, yeah, we're, we're not meaning to take a shot at Beyonce. But Tina Turner is... I know, is I'm not saying that... Is, is one, Tina Turner is one of one. Right, because it's, it's not even that I'm saying that Tina's voice is necessarily even better than Beyonce's. It's just you can't replicate Tina. You can't. Uh, no. in, in really anything. And I, I was, I mean, I, I, I saw actually, I rewatched the movie just a few months ago. Uh, and I, I didn't know that she was sick. Actually, I, did, I just learned that a few months ago when Chris Bournet and I we were shooting the shit just like off camera. And uh, and he said, oh, she, she's not doing really well. And I don't, I don't know how I missed that, but mm -hmm. that might have sort of triggered me what rewatching what's love got to do with it. And just, I think that era from 76 to 84, where she's in limbo, like absolute limbo, just mm -hmm. living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and, and for her to have a comeback at age 44, which let's be blunt, that doesn't happen in rock. She, well, she's she. I believe is still the oldest female solo artist that had top the top one hundred. No, hot one hundred. Cher took that over. Oh, Cher took that over at the time she was. Okay. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, at the time that was the case. Uh, Cher took that with Believe. Okay. Uh, so, but and so I'm, I was trying to think because I knew we would be talking about that a lot today. So I was twelve when that happened, and I remember my mom getting excited. You know, because she grew up with that. And then you're, uh, then you're looking at Tina again. She's obviously older. And I'm just going from my 12-year-old perspective. But again, nobody looked like her. Nobody mm. carried that. With the swagger when we didn't know what that word was. That word didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And just for her to be able to do that, for her to have that perfect comeback song, especially for those who knew what she went through. Mm -hmm. And it stayed. Uh, I think a lot of people when when she passed, there, you see a lot. There was a lot of songs that were were trending on Twitter, like uh, "River Deep, Mountain High," uh, "Simply the Best." Although I think that was more meant not necessarily for the song, but we, right, right, right. Uh, 
like I said, for people to, when they go back on Jim Brown, I'm going to encourage everyone. I, I think I've said this to you before, but I'm going to say this here again. I think the most slept on rock album of the seventies is think of all covers and it's Tina Turner, Acid Queen, 1975. Yeah. You brought that up. Yeah. I thought I had. Yeah. Cause I, I know I've said, I've, I've, I've thought this for a long time. So I, that's the one I re-listened to because it's just that good. And yes, mm. she's doing other people's hits, and it does, and it's it don't matter. It doesn't it don't matter. matter. Yeah, yeah. She um, first African American and first woman ever appear on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, oh, really? Okay. Really? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was it was the second episode. It was the second. It did. Uh, Rolling Stone started sixty seven, so it's the uh, second it issue. But she was still the first one there. Oh, uh, okay. I was thinking maybe it was 84. So, oh, no, 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 no. Back, it was back in 67. But she's at twice in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Hollywood Rock of Fame. Uh, she was on the greatest 100 greatest arts of all time, mm-hmm. uh, Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, 12 Grammys, one of the best selling arts of all time. And in 1988, she set a Venice World Record for the largest paying audience for a solo performer, which had 180,000 people. Come see her live. That still exists, right? That's still right. Then let's see what it is. See what it is now. Um here we got it. Um so that was at Maracana Stadium in Rio, broken in 1990 by Paul McCartney at the same stadium. The current rate, the current record is allegedly 500,000 in March of 2017 by somebody named Indio Solari, an Argentine rap, a musician and singer. So this was in the city of Olavaria, which is in near Buenos Aires. Mm. So, yeah. Correct me if I'm like, wrong. Tina was one of your biggest wants, I believe, for the Rock Hall. Oh, yeah. I, Tina was... She was, the, she was number one, was she not? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, Tina, Tina was one for a very long time. Um, and my new number one is uh, is Patty LaBelle. It's Diana Ross is there as well. But Patty, but Diana Ross is at least in once. Patty's not in at all. So, well, I thought it was actually Diana Ross higher than Patty LaBelle for you. But... I, it, it, I, I will take either. Uh-huh. Uh, but Patty LaBelle and of course, and Cher is there as well. I have, they're, they're just people who you can't write the history of music without. They need to be in somehow. Uh, I think Cher should be on her own other than with Sonny, but if it's with Sonny, I'm, that's not going to hurt me either. She needs to be in there. So. The ghost of people, Mackie, people, people advocating for for uh, novelty acts like the B-52s. Sorry, I can't help but take a shot. Uh, the, let's get these other folks in first. I, I, I thought when you were sort of going that sarcastic thing, it was going to be sticks, but okay. <laughs> yeah, sticks is a novelty act. Sticks just sucks. Well, no, I did, that was before you said novelty, right? Because oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, six just sucks. No, it's, uh, it's... The, B, the B the B 52s are a very enjoyable novelty act. So, if you're gonna put B fifty, I'll 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 hear your arguments of B fifty twos after another Doctor, day. After Doctor Demento gets in as a uh, as a musical excellence. Wow. Okay. So. But I could do what Fred Schneider does. Yeah, that's the point. So. I, that was a big cell phone, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you're, da- you're damning yourself with faint phrase. Uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah. Tina Turner and Jim Brown, this is as big a death combo as we may have ever had in the history of this show. Really? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Yeah. That's and awesome. what I thought, if we'd done the show, if we'd done the show last week, mm-hmm. uh, the biggest name would have been Doyle Brunson. Yeah, uh, uh, poker hall legend. Uh, I'm not a big poker player, but I mean, I certainly know who he is, why he's important. There's just something about this affable cowboy-looking guy mm-hmm. who looks like he's seen it all, done it all, probably because he has. Uh, first, not the f- big, the most successful poker player, but the first star, from what I can yeah. tell. 
Yep, he had 10 bracelets, 26 final tables, finishing the money 37 times. Although I have to say, back when he was at his peak in 76 and 77, uh, he did not look like the affable cowboy. He looked like the mob accountant. Uh, like, no hair, like thick glasses, like a cheap, you know. And the mob accountant on vacation is exactly what he looked like at that point. He One of the people whose style got better as he got older. Um, but, yeah. One of the uh, one of the great poker players of all time, an absolute living legend. And when poker exploded around what oh six oh seven, probably somewhere in there, Runson was like he's put out there like he's put out there like Richard Petty. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. The, like the grandfather of this sport, the guy who is holding all the things whoever is looking up to. Um, although Petty career in NASCAR, it goes at, at more than Doyle's and in, in, or Brunson's in, uh, in uh, poker. But like, that's how he was kind of held out. It's this affable grandfather, down home figure who absolutely dominated in the 70s. I believe um, it's still like at the final table of the, of the World Series of Poker. I think they call it the Doyle Brunson table. Am I correct in that? I think. That, that may be true. I haven't, I watched poker a lot in my 20s and I haven't really since. Okay, so, so note to self, do not play poker with Evan. I have three, I have three superpowers, okay? Uh, one of these superpowers is if I am in a poker tournament, I haven't done it for quite a few years now. If I'm not eliminated in the first two or three people, I will finish second. Okay. Uh, and I brought that up the last poker tournament. I can remember being in was at uh, New York Life had a retreat and we just had some people playing poker there. I told people that we had like 25 people at the beginning and I was in all in on a hand and I ended up winning it. I'm like, guys, I'm finishing second now. And everybody laughed at me. And then six hours later, I was at the two of us at the final table and <laughs> uh, I ended up finishing second. And they're like, how did you know? I'm like, it's one of my superpowers. I don't know. Two. Uh, I am very, you can give me any picture and I will pick out the perfect frame and batting for it. My wife, when we go to like, uh, we go to Michael's if we have a, ever have anything. It's the only thing she lets me do. She's like, you're way better at this than anyone I've ever met. And the third one I keep secret for another time. I give away all my secrets. So there okay. we go. One of my superpowers is whenever we go to Michael's, I don't go. <laughs> no, I'm, it's, 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 it's weird. Like even the people at Michael's like, I would never pick that, but that's perfect. I don't know why. I just get the frame and batting and everything the right way. There you so. go. Not good at anything else in interior design. I got that. So, doing great. Uh, uh, so, so the Doyle Brunson was eighty nine years old. Yeah. Do we do the fourth big name, or do we just go with but, the whole list of everything? Well, let's just do the fourth big name now. And right. this is all new. Superstar Billy Graham. Superstar, yeah. Superstar Billy Graham. Uh, his big run was before my time. Uh, while we're doing this, uh, take a look at what he just. Do a Google search of him, and but just type in 1976 or 77, because I want you to take a look at what he looked like then. Uh, born Wayne Coleman, he didn't get into wrestling until he was 30. And he was trained by Stu Hart, Bret Hart's father, and so the legendary family in Calgary. And he was a bodybuilder. He was also an evangelist. And he got sort of, he, in his first sort of like shtick, he was paired up with the Graham brothers. So like he was like one of the KFA brothers of that family that had Eddie, Doc, Dr. Jerry, Crazy Luke. And he just went with Billy because he was an evangelist. And there was an actual Billy Graham who was a massive, you're into that yeah. sort of thing. So yeah. he just sort of played off of it. I didn't realize until recently that he actually did do evangel evangelical work. I thought he got into that later in life. Uh, went into the, the then named WWWF and they were so strict. Did you see what he looked like? Yeah. Okay. Nobody looked like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was ripped in an era, in an era where bodybuilders builder, were not that big. And fortunately, big reason he got that big, you can guess. And he yeah. hung, hung out with Lionel Zelda. Yes, e e exactly. Yeah. So like he was doing a lot of things that you shouldn't do. And it really hurt him later. He was abusing his body while he was trying to perfect it, which the story of the bodybuilder, I guess. Yeah. But 
he became the champion by beating Bruno San Martino in 77. And when he won the title, he was told by Vince McMahon Sr., uh, not the Vince we know now with the funny mustache, but his dad, that, okay, you're going to lose it a year from now because they ain't playing that far ahead. Now, even though he was a bad guy in the 70s, there was no bad guy champions in the mm -hmm. WWF. They, they did, but it was only they, – they, they would hold it for 10 days just to give it to the other – to the next guy. Mm -hmm. He held it for a year. The When he finally lost it to Bob Backlund in 78, when he on the day he was told a year before, this is when you're going to lose it, even though he was told this, he was pissed because he was selling out virtually everything. Mm -hmm. so he didn't sell as many of Madison Square Garden as Bruno, but he had a higher percentage of selling out. So for modern wrestling fans, it's almost like Roman Reigns now. They could have kept this going mm -hmm. for a long time. Like the man you love to hate. Those who watch him, like Hulk Hogan, Jesse Ventura, they ripped off a lot of his cadence, yeah, his, his, his talk, like everything uh, of what he was. But Billy Graham was a bitter man after that. He would come back to the WWF in 1983. Now, at this point, he was, when we talk about how people aged him, right? So he was like 40, looked 50. He now had the mm -hmm. shaved head. He had just mm -hmm. a brown mustache and he was trying to do, he was karate or karate. He was a karate man mm -hmm. who didn't know karate. It's a problem. Yeah. Uh, I, you probably won't have time to do this, but you'll have to see like a superstar Billy Graham match in 1983 where he's trying to do a judo gimmick and you do mm. dabbling in martial arts will probably not be impressed. And neither was anyone else watching. Uh, he would come back, he would leave, come back again in 87. He was 44, but it, it, there was nothing left. The steroids that he took, especially back then, because they didn't even know what the hell they were taking. So he already had a hip replacement. They actually showed footage of the hip replacement on TV. Yeah, which was yeah, I I, I would have been fourteen looking at it like what the hell is this? Like the first time I ever watched an actual operation on television, which is a thirty thing of thirty second clip of them digging into his hip. Uh, he tried to come back, he couldn't. He tried to be a manager, he sucked at it. He tried to be a commentator, he just didn't work. They let him go, even though he and he got bitter. He made up shit. Uh, about some other people saying that he saw Pat Patterson, who was gay, try to abuse oh, yeah, ring yeah, 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 yeah. Even that scandal all. that happened. And a couple of the others yeah. did, but Pat didn't. And he later admitted that that never happened. I was just bitter. And he did that on the Phil Donahue show, hmm. which was a pretty big deal for that to happen. So he was angry for a long time. And even after that point in time, he was always seemingly sick. He had a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. I forget what. And I remember that. Like, that was like 20 years ago. He's been on death's door for a long, long time. And he always mm -hmm. seemed to come back. So, ah, man, I, think, I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying, like, for 30 years, he's always in and out of bad health. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it just because of what he did. So, as, as important as he was for the look and the style, he also has a bit of blame for pushing a look that might have I'm not I'm not going to accuse him for killing people but inspiring people to look like that and not and, and they shouldn't the human body's right. not meant to do certain things yeah and uh, I hope I painted that as balanced as I could mm -hmm. but yeah uh, another hall of famer when he was back with them because at the end he may not have been again because he got when he was pissed he was pissed Mm. I think he was inducted in, I want to say, 2004. Uh, 2004, 2005. It was 04. It was 04, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, very, very big name, very controversial in some ways, but you can't tell the story of that promotion, really wrestling without him. You can't. Good end, man. Yeah, so. Uh, he was 79 years old, so. Um, so should we just go into the death roll from here? Yeah, let's do that. I, I right. had to so, also, this score because I knew we were going to yeah. do it. It was All just right. going to be me insulting some people who were insulting WNBA. I feel very protective about it, you know, now that I, I've, I I've got a plan. Now, you, now you've made your pitch to be commissioner. I have. Um, I know you have. 
Um, so, all right. Also from the WWE, Peggy Lee Leather, also known as Lady X and oh. Fug. Okay, I know uh, her. Pa passed away at the age of sixty-four. Okay, yeah, she was um, in the the glow or the the Wow Women of Wrestling re re reboot. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I remember her. Yeah. 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 So she pa she retired in two thousand thirteen. She passed away at the age of sixty-four. Mm -hmm. Um, from can I close some of these windows to get everything going? From the world of boxing, we got this to load. Uh, former uh, WBA world light heavyweight or lightweight title holder Claude Noel from Trinidad and Tobago uh, passed away at the age of seventy four. You um, said lightweight. Lightweight, yeah. Okay. He held the he held the lightweight title in. Uh, from 79 through 81. Okay. So some successful title defenses there. Yeah. So he was uh, 31 and 10 in his career. And most of those 10 losses took place at the very end. So well, I'll have to look up if he was the only uh, champion from Trinidad. I don't think they had a whole lot of boxers. Well, he was actually from Tobago. He's Tobago in Trinidad. Oh, oh, so. My bad. Seems fair unfair to when the U.S. plays some soccer to take on Trinidad and Tobago, but you know, whatever. You did hear that, um, right? Because that did happen. Yes, I know. With the, yeah, with the reporter asking why it was unfair to the United States that they had to qualify twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry. One of the 13 founders, sorry, go, going to golf, uh, one of the 13 founders of the LPGA, Marlene Haggy, passed mm -hmm. away at the age of 89. Uh, we've gone over those 13 before. Yeah, because they, uh, they were just many of them left. They were just in their class golf group. class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she passed away at the age of 89. She won the Women's PGA Championship in 56, member of the World Golf Hall of Fame in 2002 on her own, also re-inducted again last year. Um, but yeah, she had uh, 26 career wins in the LPGA going from 52 through 72. Uh, but she was 89 years old. She's only 5'2 as well. So a lot yeah. of power, little person. Um, from the world of football, I know where I did Jim Brown, but Rodrigo Barnes, who played for the Cowboys, Patriots, and was a member of the Raiders team that won the Super Bowl XI, uh, passed away at the age of 73. Also a... Uh, member of the Rice Athletic Hall of Fame. Okay. Oh, I missed I uh I missed a tennis player, excuse me. Uh one of the great doubles tennis players of all time, Owen Davidson, passed away at the age of 79, won the doubles titles in the Australian and US Open, and won the Grand Slam of doubles titles and of uh, mixed doubles titles in 1967, winning wow. Australian French Wimbledon and US Open. Uh, back that uh, that year. So, um, also he won a total of two doubles titles on his own, and then one, two, three, four, five. Oh God, two Australians, one French, four Wimbledon's, and four U.S. Open. So how's that? Up to? Eleven, eleven Grand Slam mixed double titles. Uh, but he passed away at the age of seventy-nine. Um. From the world of hockey, a couple of these. Uh, Weldon Olson, who is a member of the 1956 and 1960 Winter Olympics teams for the United States, winning silver in 56 and gold in Squaw Valley in 60, uh, passed away at the age of 90. Um, 2002, he actually won the Lester Patrick Award for Outstanding Service to Hockey in the United States. Awesome. So he's also a member of, he's a member of the Michigan State Hall of Fame. The uh, UP Hall of Fame, Michigan Sports Hall of Fame, uh, a whole bunch of U.S. Olympic Hockey Hall of Fame, U.S. Hockey Hall what's, of Fame. What's UP? What's that? Upper, Upper Peninsula of uh, Michigan. Oh. UP. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, he passed away at the age of 90. I have more hockey players here. They're just hiding from me. There we go. Uh, also passing away, Gary Hart, or Jerry Hart, not Gary Hart, excuse me, Jerry Hart, who played – uh, 730 games in his career for the Red Wings, Islanders, Nordiques, and Blues from 68 to 82. 
uh, passed away at the age of 75. He's got his hockey card somewhere here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Don't, I, I said Gary Hart. I'm not confusing the two of them. Yeah. I apologize. Um, from, I think that's it for hockey. Sorry. Everything is taken. I have so many tabs open. My, my uh, computer is taking some time to, to load. Um, okay. From the world of curling, one of the greatest curlers of all time, Ron Northcott, a uh, nickname the Owl, three-time national and world curling champion from Canada, and member of the the uh, Curling Hall of Fame, passed away at the age of eighty-seven. So, uh, from trying to get, also doing um, Olympic sports, uh, Buddy Melgus. Uh, won gold in the Olympic Games in 72 in sailing uh, and bronze in 64 in Tokyo. Uh, he passed away at the age of 93. Um, Eddie Southern, a uh, sprinter and hurdler who won a silver medal at the 56 Olympics and silver in the 4x4, 159 Pan American Games, passed away at the age of 85. This is a mess, unfortunately. That's what I'm looking for. I, I just need these pages to load. I apologize. No, we're good. Um, oh, let's go to this while waiting on it. This is one near and dear to Boston. Uh, Rick Hoyt passed away at the age of uh, at the age of sixty one. Uh, Rick and his father Dick uh, are were famous for the Boston Marathon. Uh, Dick would push his son. Rick was in a wheelchair with... Um, you, covered, you, you covered the father recently, a few years ago. Yeah, Dick passed Dick passed away a couple years ago at the age of 80 in, in 2021. Rick just passed away at the age of 61. Uh, they, they inducted the Iron Man Hall of Fame. They received the Jimmy V Award from ESPN. Uh, and if you go to the start line in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, the only statue there is of the Hoyts. Um, passing it. So Rick died. Uh, Rick was grew up, oh, sorry, Dick grew up in my hometown of Winchester, um, Massachusetts. He passed at the age of 80 back in 2021. Uh, Rick just passed away at the age of 61. Um, so just kind of like one of those things of Boston, Boston legend, never in Boston knew, knew the Hoyts. He pushed his son at wheelchair from 77 to 2014. 2014, he was 72 years old pushing his son so or 74 years old excuse me is pushing his son so is, is the, the he had a because it wasn't just because uh, he, he was pretty he was a mobile was he not well yeah yeah because he entirely wheelchair yeah yeah, yeah. So it's so not he, like he uh, propel or anything if i remember correctly like he's yeah he had ser he had cerebral palsy yeah. um and all sorts of stuff so he could only communicate via computer um, so, but yeah, Team Hoyt, both of them are now gone. Um, from the world of basketball, let me make sure I have this all correct. Yep. So, world of basketball, Cotton Nash passed away at the age of 80, uh, out of Kentucky, played for the Lakers, Warriors, and Kentucky Colonels. Um, also played for the Chicago White Sox and Minnesota Twins. Uh, so two sport athlete played for the Lakers, sixty four to sixty five. The Warriors in sixty five. Then the White Sox sixty seven. The Twins, uh, the Colonels sixty seven to sixty eight, and the Twins sixty nine to seventy. So back and forth between the two sports. Uh, and his number, his uh, jersey's been retired at the University of Kentucky, number forty four. So he passed away at the age of eighty. Um. Back to the Olympics. Here's the rest of them. Uh, so Terry McDermott, uh, speed skater known as the Essexville Rocket, won the gold and silver medals, uh, gold in Innsbruck and silver in Grenoble in 64 and 68, uh, passed away at the age of 82. Um, grew up in Essex, Massachusetts. So um, there you go. He actually was on, he actually was uh, the other guest 
on the Ed Sullivan show in 1964 before the Beatles came out. Mm. So nobody, not many people remember that, probably. Probably not. But, yeah. Probably the only time he ever opened for the Beatles. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Beatles, I can come back to them in a second. Um, let's do this first. Uh, Fusechi Pegasus passed away. The horse that won the Kentucky Derby in 2000 and Lord, Lord, I could tell you. Uh, but he passed away at the age of 20. There it is. He passed away at the age of 26. He won the uh, Kentucky Derby in 2000. So, and set a record at auction selling 70 for $70 million just to stud after that. That's the best, you know, they're, they're, that's the best athlete, essentially, job, is is, yeah. is, a, is, a, is a thoroughbred racehorse. I mean, what's your job after you've competed to fuck? To get, to get as many attractive females of your species and mm -hmm. fornicate with them. That's your job. That is literally yeah. your job now. Yeah, and people are, people will pay $70 million so you have the opportunity to do that. So. There's so few of us who's, who has sperm that are that important. So few, that is entirely true. Of us. Um, of uh, Yes, us is a word. Um, we had a couple, from, a couple people from baseball. Um, Futoshi Naka, uh, Nakanishi, the Japanese Baseball Hall of Famer, uh, passed away at the age of 90. He uh, was a legendary both as a player and a manager. as a rookie of the year in Japan in 1952, won the MVP in 56. Uh, seven times member of the best nine, which is their basically first team sort of there, and three time Japan Series champion. Um, he passed away, as I said, at the age of 90. Also passing away, Don Denkinger passed away, the umpire from 89, uh, from 69 to 98. Um, best known for the call he blew than anything else, the safe call. Uh, for the Royals uh, against the Cardinals in the 85 World Series. Uh, but he passed away at the age of 86. Um, okay. Now, basically, we have, oh, I forgot. the. Um, I don't know if we're including this within the Beige Mistress, but Andres Ardorjan, the first ever Hungarian Grand Chess Master, uh, passed away at the age of 73. I don't know if that counts. Only the Beige Mistress knows for sure. One of the best knows for sure. And I do want to bring up one other person before we get to all, everyone else's music. Helmut Berger, who is kind of like an androgynous sex symbol in a whole bunch of different movies and TV shows over the years, uh, passed away at the age of 78. All right. I, um, I look up who that is. Helmut Berger? Yeah, Helmut Berger. Okay. Yeah, you, it seems to seem like oh, I've seen that guy before. Um, oh, well, so. actually, that's the first thing that came. I swear that all this stuff they. They know exactly how the hell did that come up almost right away? I don't know what to tell you. So 78. Everybody else like we lost this year is from music. Um, so let's just do this quickly. Um Lester Scott Sterling, and also known as Mr. Versatile, Jamaican trumpet and saxophone player, one of the key people in creating the ska music sound, uh, passed away at the age of 87, and one of the founding members of the ska light. Ska, uh, sorry. Scatolites, which mm -hmm. is where ska comes from, the name. Um, also passing away, uh, Pete Brown, uh, who known for his work with Cream and Jack Bruce. All he did was write Sunshine of Your Love, White Room with uh, Black Curtains, and I Feel Free. Other than that. So other, than that other than that, what did he, what yeah. was he good at? Um, so he, he passed away at the age of 82. Uh, from Metal Church. Uh, hold on. It got all frozen on me. Um, from Metal Church, uh, drummer Kirk Arrington passed away at the age of 61. Uh, guitarist Sheldon Reynolds, who played with Sun, the Commodores, and Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, passed away at the age of 63. Also performed with Smokey Robinson and a whole bunch of other folks as well, but was actually toured with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, uh, Bill Lee, the father of Spike Lee, uh, passed away at the age of 84, 
composed the music for things like she's got to have it do the right thing and Mo Better Blues for his son. I didn't know. I did not uh, know that his father was a musician. Yeah, he's a jazz musician, double bass, bass guitar. Uh, also yeah. played with and one of those people again. He's a session musician. Played with Cat Stevens, Harry Belafonte, Gordon Lightfoot, Aretha Franklin, uh, Odetta, Simon and Garfunkel, Ian and Sylvia, Burt Backrack, Peter Paul, Mary, Arlo Guthrie, John Lee Hooker, Duke Ellington, uh, the Clancy Brothers, Clancy, uh, and Bob Dylan. Uh, and he's the guy playing bass guitar on It's All Over Now, Baby Blue for Bob Dylan, for example. Ooh, wow. um, so he and Dylan are actually the only two people performing on the original track of that. Hmm. Um, so, but he uh, he passed away at the age of 94. I uh, heard of him. It's, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a few more. Uh, another session musician, John Gilbin, acoustic and bass, uh, bass player, Played with Peter Gabriel, Annie Lennox, Manfred Manns, Earth Band, Phil Collins, Fish, Simple Minds, Kate Bush, uh, Yes, like a whole bunch of people. He passed away at the age of 71. I love these session musicians. This because oh, they're ridiculous. Absolutely. With the people they play with. Um, Richard Landis, uh, who uh, passed away at the age of 77. Um, a studio, uh, a studio producer did all sorts of stuff with uh, Poco and Juice Newton, the Smithereens, Tina Turner. He actually was, uh, Tina Turner recorded at his studio. Vince Skill, Tori Amos, Joan Armatrading, all sorts of folks like that. Uh, he passed away, as I said, at the age of 77. Uh, Algie Ward, punk rock and heavy metal bass guitarist who played with the Saints, more, more I think of him most with the Damned, uh, passed away at the age of 63. Um, Floyd Newman, a saxophonist band leader, uh, member of the Memphis Horns, a uh, member of B.B. King's backing band in the 1940s. He passed away at the age of 92. Uh, I'm sorry, 91. I miscounted there. And then, as I said, I was going to bring up a Beatle here. Uh, the guy who took over as their uh, temporary bass guitarist, Chaz Newby, uh, who played with the Beatles for only four engagements, uh, passed away at the age of 81. Um, I've never heard that name before. Yeah, he was supposed to go with them. The Be the Beatles were going back to West Germany for their second trip, and he refused to he decided he wanted to go back to college rather than keep playing with the band. Wow. So and so McCartney. You think, think he got drunk with Pete Best all the time? No, well, Best was the one who recommended him, so probably. Um, but uh, yeah, so when he left. Uh, they want they try to get Harrison, but he refused to switch to bass. So McCartney, who's playing get piano and guitar, just reluctantly became the bass player after New Newby left. So, and the last name I want to bring up, I guess the biggest name outside Tina Turner passed away. Uh, the bassist for the Smiths, Andy Rourke, passed away at the age of fifty nine. Mm -hmm. um, so he joined the Smiths after their first gig. So Johnny Marr and he had been friends all in school. And when their first uh, bass player wasn't working out, they brought Andy Work in. So he was officially with them since the beginning. Uh, also recorded with Sinead O'Connell, pretend his early 90s uh, and things like that. But he was only 59 years old. I don't know what he passed from. Uh, pancreatic cancer. Mm. So uh, just the Smiths are one of those bands. I don't know. Uh, uh, when they'll get in, because uh, Morrissey's an asshole. Uh, but yes. uh, but if they do, Andy Rourke is certainly one of the people who's going to be going in with him. It's just unfortunate he's not around for it. So yeah, the Morrissey accepting acceptance speech will be. I don't know if interesting is the right word. My name is Morrissey, and I'm depressed. <laughs> Yeah, that man is.
Oh, that man is Morrissey. That's another one of one yeah. in a bad way. Because it, mu it must be awful to be talented, good looking, and adored by virtually uh, everybody. Yeah. And yet be emo. It's just not fair. Yeah. They, they, the Smiths will be number one on the new list, by the way. They've taken yeah. over the number one spot. Uh, it's taken me a little bit longer just to... to oh, uh, over, over Coldplay? Coldplay's top 10. I, don't, I hate Coldplay, but the votes have been good. I, actually, I'll, I'll tell you this now. Uh, out of people who've gotten at least 25 votes, take a guess who's actually got the highest vote to percentage. All right, I'll have to give you a hand. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, too, it's too big a group. Yeah, uh, so pretty much his run was from the late 60s to the mid 80s in terms of actual success. He, I don't think he ever wrote um, any of the songs. Iggy Pop. No. Uh, most of his hits were, how do I put this? Uh, okay, well, so one of his big hits was uh, used as as the theme on a television show for, that ran for a few years. They might be giants. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I just know they did Malcolm in the middle. Uh, I don't know. What would you do if I said... Oh, Joe Cocker? Yeah. I, don't know. I love Joe Cocker. 97.8% right now. Wow. Yeah. She came in through the bathroom window. I, that, that was a that was a man in my entire life I knew was not going to live to seventy. <laughs> he beat a lot of odds. I'm telling you that. Yeah, he made it to his sixties, but that was about it. So when Joe Cocker died, you're like, you're like, yeah, this seems about the right time. So it, I, I I almost feel like I fell with with superstar. Like I was expecting him to die for the last 30 years it, like no, it never it wouldn't have shocked me yeah just uh and again so a lot of it's self-inflicted yep. anyway yeah so i thought that was sort of interesting uh to bring that up or oh, i don't i don't know why that is uh also a lot of you don't really like kid rock Wonder what that could be. Capricorn, Detroit cities where I so here's the problem with Kid Rock. Sorry, there are lots of problems with Kid Rock, but my biggest problem with Kid Rock is he says, you know, singing Sweet Home Alabama all summer long. He's not singing a song over Sweet Home Alabama, he's singing over Werewolves of London. I, I don't it drives me insane every single time it comes on. And I love Werewolves of London, so mm -hmm. I have no problem with the bass line. I don't mind that's a Kid Rock song that we hear on everything. But come on, if you're going to sing about Sweet Home Alabama, just use Sweet Home Alabama. Is, I will I will go to my grave saying Ba Wada Ba is a banger. Sure. I absolutely love that song. I'll go to my grave saying that I've never seen him and Dr. Phil in the same room. <laughs> I think you've said that before. I think, is there a meme that shows that or something? Like, yeah, they look exactly alike. He looks exactly like Dr. Phil right now. If Dr. Phil took a, an AR-15 and shot Bud Light cases. Yeah. I guess so. you need target for I don't know. I'm uh, staying out of that one. Probably the best. I'm just saying that's the last time we've seen anyone seen him do anything. So, uh, I, But his duet partner got in with uh, Cheryl Crow. So you never know. Were they not a couple for a bit at one point? I, have, I hope not. I have no... I, I'm really bad at celebrity couples. Yeah, I am too. So. Especially now, considering I don't know what a celebrity is anymore. Yeah, Maybe we are. We have an IMD page, IMDb page. There you go. That's true. Look at that's true. Right someone, but there was one on Twitter like a month ago where someone like took a screenshot of the headline of a article and said, I have no idea what any of the words in the sentence mean. <laughs> and I was like, it's like some person had some gotten an argument with some person over something, and I had no idea who either the people were or the thing they were talking about. I was like, yeah, that that's me. The great thing about getting older is you just care a lot less about a lot of things that were very frivolous at one point. As yeah, I see this, while we do have a kind of a frivolous show, but anyway, uh, yeah. it's still fun. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, Elevator up. 
Elevator down. Elevator up, elevator down. It is my section where I look at somebody in the past, I guess in this case, two weeks who have made a better Hall of Fame case or a worse Hall of Fame case. I've got three this time. One is I'm just going to gloss over because it's a repeat offender. John Morant, what are you doing? Uh, oh, shit. Somebody get this. I know they already did a wellness check. I don't know what's going on in this guy's head. I want him to be okay. I, I really do. But I, I don't know, Evan. I mean, like, when you do something that costs you that much money, costs but you. I had, to, I had to do a wellness check on him this week because it's something posted online. Yeah, yeah, because because you could. I, I saw that because it could be interpreted as a suicide note. Which it wasn't, but I mean, I could see why you would take that. You you wouldn't take that chance, mm -hmm. you know. But I I don't know how you do something that stupid and then do it again when you already know what the consequences are. Uh, Kwame Brown had the tweet of the day. Uh, yeah, and worst tweet. Yeah, because he said, "I know who NBA Young Boy is," and now we all know who. I'm paraphrasing it, I got it wrong. But now we know who NBA Dumb Boy is. Yeah, and then and then today he talked. Then he he got he trended again. I thought, oh, what funny thing did he say? What LeBron doesn't have a killer instinct? What? There's a lot I can shit on LeBron. That ain't one of them. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, so Ja, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, you were they were ready to make you the face of the league. And he's still might. He's the face of the league in the wrong way now. Wow. Well, I mean, how how long do you think he gets suspended? I was wondering that because I mean you got to do something because he's already done it. So he, he was suspended for the for four games before. You've got to suspend him for at least ten. Oh, I think I think he's out half the season. He had a yeah. Have you listened to what Adam Silver said? In no, that thing? Adam Silver and he sat down and talked, and Jaw said, "I think this is a one time thing." Like, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And then within like a week, did it again or whatever, a month, did it again. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any uh, question that Silver is pissed. And like anyone who's like, oh yeah, this is this thing that, you know, modern NBA players, show me another one doing it. Show me any other player in the NBA who's doing this. I can tell you the last player I remember doing it, Gilbert Arenas. And that was... 15, 18 years ago? We didn't do it and on he, social media because right, there wasn't yeah, one. But. There wasn't social media. He had it in a locker room. But yeah. it, this combined with the thing I did hear about before this, where they were pointing the laser lights at the the coaching staff or the, the scouting staff from the Pacers mm -hmm. in the tunnel and like threatening them. Like I think he's out for he's out for at least a quarter of the season. So if it's 82 game season, he's out at least 20. I say twenty to twenty-five is probably where we end up. If it's a half a season, I'm not shocked though. Silver's going to nip this in the bud. Just be like this isn't freaking happening, guys. No, no more of this crap. You can't. It's it's colossally idiotic. It might be one of the dumbest things that I've ever seen anyone do. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, for someone who didn't use drugs or something, it's got to be the dumbest thing I've seen. So well, that's the other thing too. I don't think he's on anything when he's doing this I shit. I mean. Dude wants to be a dude wants to be a uh, a gangster. Like what was it? Uh, Big Waz, Wozni, uh, whatever his name is from uh, the Ringer, said that he thinks that uh, that Josh should go and have an internship with a gang, just it's, hang out with him for a couple of weeks and see what that life is really like. It, it's it's like the old saying goes, and you can use that for almost anything. Cool people don't tell you they're cool. Gangsters don't tell have to tell you they're a gangster. And right. you can sort of like use that for a whole whack of other. It's like I would say, no, I'm going to dump on LeBron. Uh, smart people don't have to tell you they're smart. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but this is, oh, well. Uh, so he's my obvious elevator down. But I, I went with a couple other ones because I don't know that I've ever done that for these halls before. And so I've got a trivia question here for you that you may not know. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go to tennis. So, okay. I don't know you now if you've been following what's been uh, some of the latest tennis news, you'll know this right away. If, but it may not have made that much news. So beyond after the Williams sisters, who is, who has made the most money on the women's tour? Who's number three all time? 
And it probably, it's probably someone I don't know. I'll say, I mean, my first thought is Martina Hingis, um, but I'm sure that's probably wrong. Yeah, it's uh, Simona Halep of Romania. Oh, really? Yeah, blew my mind too. Wow. So she's my elevator down because she got popped for, uh, I guess, PEDs or whatever, or, or some kind of other substance. Now, I don't know what the Tennis Hall of Fame, how they look at this sort of thing. I got no clue. Uh, I, I find that the bar for that hall is a little bit low. Uh, I call it sort of the Jennifer, the Capriati. Because Jennifer Capriati is okay. in the hall uh, for, and, she, and I thought, man, that, didn't she sort of Dave Parker her way out of this? But no, she didn't. Uh, she only has like 14 w wins and two majors. Simona's mm -hmm. got two majors, but 24 wins or 22. I forget exactly how much. But she's now contesting this. But let's be blunt. We know how this usually always plays out. So... I can say elevator down, but I don't know if the hall even knows about this. Ele uh, Karis, I have no clue. Mm -hmm. if, if that's a factor at all. I suspect it isn't, but we'll see. I mean, so it's her. I mean, Sharapova still plays, right? Maybe. So, I haven't paid that much. As I, once, I used to be really into tennis. Um, but, uh, since I've had kids, stuff has fallen the wayside and tennis is one of those things. Some, some things so, have to go. I, I haven't been following it. College football, tennis, and recently college basketball. And honestly, baseball, even I, I'll watch a little bit now, but even baseball has begun to fall off for me. So well, for me, it's part of my gig as a trophy husband, but anyway. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so, so I have an elevator up and this is going to be really interesting because again, this might do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a PGA champion winner, uh, Brooks Kepke, who's now a five-time major winner, but he's the oh, first yes. winner uh, while he's while he's pretty much assigned to the LIV. Mm -hmm. So we know how the Hall, I'm pretty sure we know the Hall does not take kindly to this based on their whole tradition. Again, I don't know this for sure. I think mm -hmm. I read something to that effect, but I, I could be mistaken. But now he's added a fifth. He's a member of the five-time club. He's only 32. He's going to compete in more majors. I, this may do absolutely nothing because they might have already sort of, a lot of the people who might be voting on this say, you're there, you're not coming in here. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll find out with a couple people who are going to be coming up who are bigger names than Kepke. Well, well, I mean, I did send you that article over the week that all of the golfers have dropped out of the LIV lawsuit against the PGA. Yeah. So but we'll see still, what happens once once that lawsuit is, I mean, it's officially dropped at this point. There's no one left. So we'll see what happens. So, But, I mean, it, this to me is an elevator up based on your mathematical accomplishments, but it, it can be completely ignored. Sure. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. And this is another hall that the bar is not exactly that high but mm -hmm. they're going to have an issue if, if more people go there if it's the same amount of people mm -hmm. well, the the talent pool in the pj has taken a pounding whether people want to admit that or not uh it, no, it's 100 yeah it's funny i almost everyone i talk to when this when the golf comes up knows what the lv is i don't know anyone who's actually watched it mm -mm. So I don't even know where you'd watch it. I can honestly don't. I'm not a big enough golf fan to actually make that effort either. But, you know, billionaires and their toys. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's an elevator up, but a very tentative one. Because, again, I got no clue whether that means a damn thing. I'm sure for a few people who vote, it means nothing. I'm sure they're mm -hmm. more pissed at it more than anything. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people. I know there was a lot of people unhappy that he won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And but he was asked about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. He said, "I wasn't really thinking about what this meant for LIV. I was thinking about what it meant for me and everything. Sure, it's good for LIV, but like he did. I it made it seem like he was focused on himself. I think he just didn't want to talk about it. Well, but then uh, he didn't have to because his trainer did all the all the shit talk for him. 
That is true. So, I mean, and I'm that's sure- That's why you have an entourage. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so he was there taking the bullets and that's part of part of his gig. And the bullets there don't mean anything to him. So he he pretty much laid everything out. And I could maybe, I, mean, I might have even talked myself into that this is actually getting an elevator down because he was shitting up the, his proxy was dumping all over the PGA. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, it, this is going to be really, really interesting moving forward depending on how, how they look at everything. And I don't know. Right. I really don't know. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I, I'm just not going to, if I keep going, I'm just going to talk myself in circles. Good, bad, and ugly. What do you got? Oh, hold on. Right. Um, I guess I'm going to do quick three quick ones who have been here a long time. Sure. Uh, let's just talk about the the one I want to talk about the most is the bad. So let's start with the good. Okay. Uh, so we're going to do two on soccer and one on basketball. So the good from basketball, when I say the greatest victory in the history of a country happened today, I'm not exaggerating. Okay. So one of the things that most people aren't paying attention to very much is U20 World Cup, um, which is one of those things that's really important to the development of countries uh, and their soccer programs. Today, the Gambia defeated France in the U20 World Cup. The Gambia has actually won both of their games thus far in the in the tournament and by far the greatest victory in the history of the gambia in in any sport uh do you can you tell me where the gambia is i know it's in africa i think it's a relatively small country so i'm going to guess it's uh probably somewhere in proximity to the ivory coast what you are so you know senegal kind of looks like a whale yeah. If the thing's hit down the middle, mm -hmm. that's the game. Oh, okay. So it's it's just that it's it's that little itty bit. It's like 15 miles on either side of the of a river is what that is. And it's not even on the coastline, right? It is on the coast. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. But to say that this is the greatest win in their history, they have so far beaten Honduras and France. They play South Korea next. But they've automatically advanced to the next round of a tournament for the first time uh, outside a continental tournament ever. So when something like this happens and you beat France and if they beat South Korea, I mean, this is by far the greatest opportunity they've ever had in their country's history for any of this stuff. They could have easily wrestled on their laurels after beating Honduras. Yeah. But yeah, they, they beat France. France now has to beat Honduras to have a shot at third place to advance. Uh, they've lost to both South Korea and now the Gambia. Where is so, that being held? Uh, it's Argentina. Argentina, okay. Yeah. Before before you go on the next one, just a quick thing. I wore something that I haven't worn in five years. That would be a certain Boca, no, or three years, a certain Boca Junior shirt. Mm. And I'm just going downstairs because there's the there's the Manitoba liquor thing. Guy looks at me and says, I'm not letting you in. <laughs> the hate is real, my friend. And, and I said, like, what? And it's just like, I you know what this is i'm like yeah i know what that is so i yeah. I, I thought man i yeah. automatically thought of you but anyway go on so, anyway uh so good for them they've advanced to the the second round the knockout stages just by the way the u.s has also advanced to the knockout stages through two games they've beaten ecuador and the booming metropolis of fiji um so they they have slovakia in their last uh their last um, group game, but as if things go according to the way things are right now, and they win their first round, the U.S. and Gambia would face each other in the quarterfinals of this tournament. So, good for them. I just have to bring that up when something like that happens. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, ug the ugly, I want to go back, I'm going to rip on a former Celtic here. Um, Kendrick Perkins. Uh, so, Kendrick Perkins back in April during the MVP debate, was saying that the only reason anyone would vote for Jokic was racism. That mm -hmm. people hate black players and that Jokic was not good enough for any of that stuff and you vote for Embiid and everything else. 
I'm willing to believe at this point that Perkins, who first of all has changed his tune, uh, not just because he thinks now the Nuggets are good. I don't think Perkins ever really watched the Nuggets game, is what it came down to. Uh, he was accusing of Jokic of stabbing, of having his stats for a triple double uh, and a few other things along those lines, as if Embiid would never ever do that. Uh, and like, I, I'm glad to see that that Jokic is getting his due. He's ridiculous. Uh, one of my best friends is a now a Nugget season ticket holder and gives us updates all the time on the games. Uh, and just as like, dude, you guys have to see Jokic in person. He's he's incredible. And I think everybody saw the sweep of the Lakers. I repeat, the sweep of the Lakers. Uh, no, again, no. And I don't. I also will not hear any LeBron slander. By the way, that dude carried that team in that series. He did. He left. He played in Game Four. He played forty-seven minutes and fifty-six seconds. They gave him four seconds of rest in that game. Uh, 40 points just absolutely carried him. Regardless of what you think of LeBron, they did not lose because of LeBron. I will never shoot on I, I've never shit on him as, him as a player. Yeah. They, will, they, they did not lose because of him. But Jokic is just that good. Uh, and Kendrick Perkins looks real dumb uh, with something at the time he was ripped for. And now it's just like he has had to walk back. Uh, he had to walk it back after the Sun series, but he's walked it back even further. Well, okay. even back when that all happened, and he and he did that, and JJ Redick just lost his mind. Yeah, and it was decent cherry picking stats on that, and and I, I look back at all those ones because the ones in question, it, what was it, uh, Nowitzki, Nash, and I forget who the other one was. Nash, we knew what type of player he was. He was a distributor. That that was, and he made everyone around him better. Uh, Nowitzki was just off that. He was eleventh, but Kobe, who was the uh, the playoff, who was the scoring leader, the Lakers were five hundred. Mm-hmm. So who who are you giving it to? I mean, mm-hmm. yes, you can take a look at us at a fact. I'm just spitting facts. I'm just spitting facts. I, I'm, it's a terrible Kendrick, but that's what he did. Like right after when like uh, uh, you gotta work, you gotta work on the beard. Yeah. Uh, as good as it's gonna get but yeah Kendrick he clowned himself again and he's very good at that exceptional at clowning himself yes uh and Reddick and I'm not always a big fan of what Reddick says I, I know you're not with a couple of things that he, he said in the past but Reddick was 100% spot on like Reddick is angling for I think if the Celtics had gotten swept he trying to get himself in as a contender for the coaching position. I'm not well, they were talking him. about him in Toronto. So yeah. Um that that said, Bob Cousy is right. You know what you called JJ Reddick during Cousy's era? Oh I know. No. A fan. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah so, that, just by the way, I just want to just bring this up one more time. All these arguments saying that Babe Ruth would never have been good in the modern era, whoever never been good in the modern era, whoever to think that someone who has the talent of a Bill Russell or or, a, or a Bob Cousy or a Babe Ruth or a Jackie Robinson or you name the thing wouldn't be any good now. The, I heard a whole bunch of Tony Gwynn slander uh, that was on the oh. internet the other day. That Tony Gwynn was would be an average right fielder these days. Bullshit. Like the idea because people are pitching faster. You don't think Tony Gwynn would do more? I guarantee like, you. Do. You know how a big I'm a I'm a big Tony Gwynn. He's my favorite baseball player of all time. Tony Gwynn was doing all the, he was looking at those computers back when it was, look, was Pong level. And right. uh, he really was to try and get better. That guy, I mean, well, what did another interview I, I, I saw him do? He just said like, like he was pretty much in awe when he finally got to meet Ted Williams. Yeah. Like well, Ted, Ted, yeah. Ted Williams loved that man. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but, but like just the idea that these guys who grew up in, in times where the training regiments weren't the same and like, like, there are pictures of the dream team where Jordan and Bird and stuff are like drinking beers in a corner and playing ping pong, right? Mm-hmm. Like that stuff doesn't really happen like that anymore. People aren't smoking anymore. I get it. Things have changed. To think like the really talented people from the past wouldn't make the effort to try and be good now is insane. It's just insane to me that mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, let's say Gwyn. That Gwyn wouldn't still hit 300 now. Because they're throwing an average of 
six, seven miles an hour faster than they were in 1987. He was like, a computer brain. He, he would have known what they were going to throw before they did this with all the modern a- analytics. It's just dumb. I'm sorry. And I, I just that's J.J. Reddick's thing, why he hates Bob Cousy uh, or thinks Cousy's overrated. Uh, but like, he was right on this, 100%. Yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, he was saying, like, I'm just tired of this era where you've got to come up with something to fill the time. And Somebody probably gave yes. Kendrick this. Kendrick President, I need something to talk about. I don't believe Kendrick would look this shit up on his own. No, it, it's 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 the laziest common denominator. It's the whole way that Boston sports radio works. It's just like you you say something ridiculous and then you completely contradict yourself the next day without ever say, re- revealing that you said something ridiculous. Just back and forth and back and forth. And it's just yep. freaking that's the other thing too that sort of like pisses me off about this here again with, with, with Jokic. So here's we here we have somebody who's the two time MVP, could have been a three time MVP. Probably I think a lot of people felt it was Embiid's turn. Yeah, I mean, it was it was Embiid. I mean, it's been Embiid, Giannis, and and Jokic for the last five years, back and forth. And Embiid didn't have one yet. I have no problem him winning it. Yeah, so. but Jokic, who's a basketball superstar, is not a superstar. True. Yo, and, Jokic, if he never got interviewed again, would be a very happy man. Right. So he doesn't seek fame. He doesn't, if he's got a national endorsement, I've never seen it. Uh, I don't think he gives a crap. Uh, Denver was finished as the number one seed, and a lot of people didn't even watch it because they weren't on national television hardly at all. Jokic, right. and then you have, you have uh, Kendrick saying, well, it's all this favoritism towards these white players. Like, uh, no. Your superstars are right now all black, because mm-hmm. they, frankly, because not because Actually, they're black, because they're more charismatic, they're, they're more interesting. The vast majority of superstars are European. Let's talk. Let's talk no, no, okay. That. I'm sorry. Let, let, let me rephrase that. Uh, when I say superstars, I mean tra- people who are your faces of the league. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I apologize. Because yeah, your best player. Yeah, yeah the your three, your the three best players in basketball right now are all European. Jokic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jokic, Embiid, and and Giannis, and you can throw Doncic in there. Well, as a... okay. he's not Embiid's not European, but he's not non-American. Oh, I'm sorry, he's not American. I I take that back. You're right. But I'm, also, I, too... I, I was thinking Doncic in my head, and then I just moved that over to Embiid. My bad. Okay, but so let's let's take those four. Let's add those four players. Now you can argue then the four biggest names are all not those guys, just names. LeBron. Uh, LeBron, Curry, mm-hmm. Durant, and Tatum. Tatum's a bigger name now. Maybe he's a bigger draw. He's pretty okay. He's positioned more now. Is it because they're black? No, it's because all four of them talk more. Curry's got charisma up his ass. LeBron is LeBron. LeBron can talk. Uh, Giannis doesn't talk much. He can. But he just Tatum. doesn't. Tatum's whole brand is I'm good at basketball and I'm a great father. That's his brand. <laughs> That's a brand. I mean, it's more than some of the others who don't have any brand at all. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's like the same shit that you probably heard as a kid about Larry Bird. Oh, well, he's getting more more plays because he's white. Okay, well, he does stand out more. That's for damn sure. But anyone who ever played against him never said it. Yeah, I there. I watched something on Larry Bird the other day, and now I have all these YouTube recommending all these videos of other players talking about Larry Bird and uh, Patrick Ewing was talking about Larry Bird and he grew up in Boston. Patrick Ewing grew up in Boston, uh, uh, but was a Sixers fan because uh, he loved Dr. J and Moses uh, and hated Larry Bird. And he got to league and all his friends like, can't jump, can't do all these things, got to the league. And Larry was just a talking shit. He was a, like one of the greatest, you have all time, all time top five shit talkers in the history of the NBA. Larry Bird is on that team. Bird Jordan, you can you fill in the rest of your the team if you'd like, right? Uh, but then he goes and he just lit up the Knicks. Mm-hmm. And he goes, he calls his buddies on the phone. He's like, I know what the fuck, I don't care if this guy can't jump. He's better than the rest of us. And uh, it, it took until they were on the dream team together mm-hmm. when they were in practice talking shit back and forth. And he talked shit back to Larry and made Larry laugh. Mm-hmm. And they were like buddies after that. <laughs> like you just you just go listen like like Charles Oakley talk about him like all these guys who are like tough guys almost like no Bird was a bad man except for Isaiah 
I say I hated Bird. Said if he was a black guy, he'd just be another, just be another player. But uh, I mean, that was that was Isaiah. And there's a reason Isaiah wasn't on the dream team. Um, yes, so yes, there was. But yes, there uh, was. yeah, so there was a few. There are a few, and one of them was Michael, and the other one was Jordan. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, let me just get the last thing so we can get out of here. It's been a long time. Yep. My bad, I've talked about before. The U.S. national team still doesn't have a coach. Still. And it doesn't look like they're going to have a coach for a while. They're taking their time with the search. Here's the problem. Today's the 25th of May that we're recording this. The 24th of June, by my math, was less than a month away, correct? Well, if, if my math is accurate, yes. So that why is the 24th of June important? Because it's the first match of the Gold Cup, the North American Championship, the Continental Championship. And we have anyone to lead. Yeah, that might be a, something that you might want. Yeah, it's the Continental Championship. I'm not saying the Gold Cup is the same thing as the European Championship or the South American Copa Libertadores or even the African Championship. What it is is a testing ground for players to get in with what the coach wants so they can put him through stuff, particularly since the U.S. does not have a qualifying thing to go through for this next World Cup. We need someone in charge. And they're not going to, I guarantee you, they're not going to have a coach in place. So if they do, the coach is going to be like me during the tournament. And he's going to be watching from the sidelines with interest. We're going to see him in the stands, whoever that person is. So, like, it's just dumb. They have had since January to do something. I mean, Berhalter is still not fired yet. He's just been, he's like twisting in the wind. He's still apparently a candidate. Now, I don't have, I don't think Verhalter is the coach we need going forward, but he doesn't deserve this shit. Like, because, fire him or don't. But like, you don't have enough people talking about it on your, on your sports media. If this was Canada and hockey, this don't happen. It's just. Asinine. The U.S. U.S. Soccer Federation is so badly run it is a clown show of an organization the u.s has an opportunity at this world cup we have the talent we have uh oh god i've forgotten his name the kid who chose us over nigeria and uh england uh oh, crap his name is just completely out of my head u.s soccer i can't help you without him while you're doing um, that, so uh, I, I did I'm, sign I'm, up. I'm, run, I'm running. I'm running it right now. Okay. Same as that. Uh, Balogun. So Flair and Balogun, uh, who on Liverpool's uh, team, he's been he's been loaned out to France uh, into Reims, but he is the opportunity to go to either England, Nigeria, or the U.S. He chose the U.S. He's going to be a starter on this team. He is probably going to be our principal striker on this team going forward. We have the scoring capability finally with the guy. He scored 41 goals this year in Europe in, in all competitions. Like we finally have the opportunity, and he's 21 years old. We mm -hmm. finally have the opportunity with the players and everything, but we need someone in charge who knows what they're doing, and we do not have it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and again, we're going into a World Cup where we have no hexagonal. There's no real qualifying thing. So these tournaments matter. Now we have the Confederations Cup, which is going to come up the year before, right? Um, I don't know what they're going to do with that because usually Confederations Cup is the host nation, the World Cup champion, and the champions of each continent. I'm presuming that either the U.S., Canada, or Mexico is going to win North America, but they're going to have too many teams. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. Um, well, we we but, got to getting our tickets. I put my, my, my name in for the... Uh... Well, just just on the news news thing list. So I guess we're, we're attacking it from the U.S. pool and the Canadian pool. The pools are shot, right? Yeah. So, but the U, the U.S. needs this. They needed someone in place two months ago. I mean, I I would give them to the beginning of April. I get it. There was some dysfunction. 
whatever, give the beginning of April. That still gives you a couple months to ramp everything up. We're a month, we're less than a month away now. The camp for this is going to open in three weeks, probably two and a half weeks for this to get everybody in to camp and get everybody going. What the fuck are we doing? That's all I'm going to say. I thought Fletcher Bad was going to be less. It's not ugly. It's not ugly yet. It's bad. Mm -hmm. It's not ugly yet. Uh, it has the opportunity to get ugly, but it right now it's just bad. So okay. There we go. All right. Well, with that, with this is going. So I'm just going to plug all the stuff that I do. Uh, or that we do here. Uh, we forgot this, by the way. Oh, that's right. Uh, hey, if you want to bet on things, bet on whether the United States is going to get a coach uh, anytime soon, or really pretty much anything at it. Or it, are, are, the, are the Celtics going to come back from uh, now three to two down? Yeah, for, for sure. And we got the best way to do that because no matter what sports you're watching on TV, there's some gambling company that's 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 associated with it, and there's a lot of them out there. And chances are, if you're a sports gambler, you might just not be betting on one thing, and you shouldn't. You should sort of like have all these ones available because some places might have some wagers that may not exist in other ways, or they might give you better odds. So let's say, uh, to Evan's point, can the Celtics make do a comeback? Well, who's paying the best odds? Well, you don't want to search it all from each one individually. Download BetStamp right now on your phone. Uh, bet stamp and then just type in whatever it is you're looking for and they're going to sort of like put the blanket right there so you know who's paying the out the best also too if you need a bit of help there's some experts you can follow what they're doing and it's really easy to do just download bet stamp and do a promo the promo code is buck 25 and you're helping us out buck 25 because i'm the buck and i'm not 25 anymore I should have done buck 50 i don't know what i was thinking i'm not sure either but continue yes uh also to uh there's been a lot of other shows that are that are coming up. I just recorded, uh, finally, the return show of the Classic Sports Review. Our good friend Glenn Pulowski is back from Antarctica. And we just, uh, we did the last ever World Hockey Association game. Okay. From 1979, right here in Winnipeg. Uh, that was, wasn't necessarily a great game, but it was really a lot of fun seeing a very, like a 17-year-old Wayne Gretzky uh, some of these characters that existed in the WHA, if you've seen sort of semi-pro, uh, the, the movie with Will Ferrell, this was sort of that league in hockey. Uh, the inspiration for a lot of the stuff from Slapshot, it was a lot of fun just re-watching that, or not re-watching, I never watched that before, but uh, so, but that show is back. Uh, we also decided, we're, we already know what we're going to pick for next time. We're going to look at roller games. Ever All right, cool. Yep. Okay, so we're going to look at that. Uh, so look at that pretty soon. Uh, the last show I did with Vinny Las Penuso, where Vinny makes the Hall of Fame case for, we finally did the one for about Pudge Heffelfinger, the first uh, first player to ever make it make money playing pro football. Okay. So that's up. Uh, there's the weekly Hall of Oh, wait, that's the show. Uh, we just also re we wrapped up our show with uh, How the Hell Did This Go Number One, which is now How the Hell Was This a Hit? Unfortunately, my partners keep picking good songs, so we just did One Night in Bangkok. Oh, and next week, yeah, but next week they pick, he picked like Bohemian Rhapsody. You're missing the point, so I'm going to give them the biggest hunk of shit. Is this uh, real life, or is this just fantasy? It is, a, like Brad's point was to sort of look at, like, really, how did this happen? Mm. It It is a... a a weird song. It's a very strange song. It's unlike any other hit. It breaks every rule. It is the greatest rock song ever to use the word Basimilla. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not even sure is a word. <laughs> you do the fandango. So we have have you ever seen the video they did of the uh literal Bohemian Rhapsody? No. You should just look that up afterwards. It's it's uh they're just acting out the the words of the of the thing are actually the lyrics to Bohemian oh, Rhapsody. Oh, okay. I, I've watched some of that literal stuff for other things, so I'll have to do yeah, that. Yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody one is one of my favorites of that. Okay, so. I'll, I'll, I know I know which uh, which channel you're talking about. Uh, so there's that. Uh, also, uh, late late June, we're going to do another episode of the the retro football show. We're going to do Super Bowl six where Dallas wins it for the first time. Oh, cool. All right. Yep. But Super Bowl three is already up, where we. Just make fun of Joe Namath, sort of. Or we're in awe of him and we make fun of him at the same time. 
if that makes any sense. The only person who really needs to be made fun of from the early Super Bowls is Gary Ukrainian. So that'll that'll be coming up. Yeah. I, I guess yeah, pretty much shortly after. Do I do a bunch of other God? I'm get, it's getting late, so I'm sure I do a, a bunch of other shows. It feels like I do. Yeah, but we're, we're, we'll figure it out next week right. <laughs> when we don't have like two of the greatest icons of the last fifty years pass away at the same time. Hopefully. Yeah, this this was well. That's what happens sometimes when we sort of uh, miss a week. But it's in a houseboat. But it, it wouldn't matter. They would have both. They both happened this week anyway. So you still have it. Anyway, man, it's it's a late night. We should let people go. Absolutely, mostly ourselves. And with that, yeah. wherever you all are, wherever you may be, stay safe, everyone. Take care. Peace.